everything's a problem. Like, you know, you know, you know, you know, Does anybody wish to be the designated note taker? Should I rephrase the question? <laughs> There's not that many of you. And, and three of you I know are doing presentations, so I can't depend on them for being the main people. Okay, I'll do it. Thank you, Phil. But only if I can get to the Wi-Fi. Okay. Please, everybody, do click on the little link to join Phil in the note-taking uh, tool, because then if you see something that Phil hasn't caught, you can go ahead and help him out. It would be much appreciated. All right. It's T plus one. T plus one is a good time to start. And I, I will give you warning that I am trying to keep an eye on Zulip in the chat, um, please wave your hands frantically if I've missed something um, that needs my attention. Uh, so, welcome to IETF 117 and the RFC series working group. Oh, um, I am Pete Resnick, and I am only Pete Resnick because, in among the other things that your chairs have uh, uh, slipped on, one is we didn't notice that Ecker had a hard conflict for this session. So it, it's just little old me today. Um, we're really trying to get better, I swear. Here's the note well, the IETF note well. This is not per se an IETF session, but we will be following, it is part of the IETF meeting, we will be following the note well as far as please note that there are all sorts of policies and procedures having to do with IPR, having to do with code of conduct that you can find in these assorted documents that are noted at the bottom. By this time in the week, you should be well aware of them. If for some reason you are not, please do check these documents out um, and um, take care to follow the processes appropriately. Step out of the room if you need to. So we have um, a, a loose agenda, even though it looks rather put together. This part is the administrivia. Um, I've allocated 20 minutes each to um, the two documents that we've been working on on the list uh, in fits and starts. John Levine, I think, is going to present on the first, and Paul Hoffman will present on the second. Then I've left a big chunk of time for Martin's presentation because it does cover all three, uh, you know, or I should say it covers the more general question uh, and the bigger policy question that I think this group is trying to address. So when we get to each of those documents, my inclination is stick to questions about pure content, you know, what does this mean? Why did you make this change? How does this change uh, work? But as far as bigger picture questions about, should we be changing XML in these particular ways? Let's hold those questions until after Martin's presentation. I've left a bunch of time there so that there can be discussion and, and it will apply to all three. Um, then I threw 10 minutes toward the end for discussion of how to get the group making a little more progress a little better. Um, I've got some of my own ideas and, uh, and then a few minutes at the end for any other business. Any bashing of this agenda? Anybody need anything else? Yeah, I I'm have sorry. a quick question. Carson, about... I'm sorry. Take, yeah, I'll pay I, attention uh, occasionally. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Carsten Bormann. So I have a quick question about uh, Paul's uh, 7997 BIS uh, draft. 
Um, th that yes, kind of um, and actually, yeah, I, and uh, the chairs need to put that out for a call for adoption. And we just, uh, again, another ball drop um, uh, on the part of the uh, chairs. But yes, that is uh, on our list of things to do after the meeting. But we, we did agree that the, the actual change that, that most people are waiting for uh, simply enabling Unicode in, in the tool is not something that this document needs to be done for. I believe that's the case. I don't think we're waiting on the yeah. tooling is, is not what's waiting on this, is it? It's just policy implementation. The, the tool Rob, currently... Robert, Robert nods at me. The tool currently only supports uh, non-ASCII characters uh, for the T element. And that, that's bad for us uh, who actually sometimes uh, uh, use lists and, and other things like that. So there, there is nodding in the room, including by Robert Sparks. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Thank you. If there's any further discussion, uh, we can do so on the list, but I think we're, we're good to go there. Thank you. All right, any other agenda bashes? Things that we're gonna need to talk about today? Moving along, um, I guess this is John. Do you wanna share the slides from your phone or, uh, or do you want me to share them and, and next slide, next slide, next slide? Excellent, I will do that. Let me stop sharing those. And let me make sure I know which ones are which. This is the as implemented or maybe 3.1 back. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You're up. Yeah. Those look, that, that looks familiar. So next. Okay. So um, back when I was. <clears throat> yeah. Back there. Um, back when I was sort of the RFC editor, um, one of the things I did was to attempt to document the, uh, the, <clears throat> the, the, the XML language that we actually use in RFCs. So RFC 7991, <clears throat> excuse me, defined the version three language. Um, and it says right in it that this is, you know, it basically says this is our best guess and it will probably evolve. And by golly, it did. Um, XML to RFC um, made some significant changes to it even before we started publishing anything. Um, and then once, we, <clears throat> then once we did start publishing stuff, there was another um, incremental set of, of, of changes. Some of the changes were specifically in, re in response to user requests, like the sort of stuff that Karsten just talked about. Some of it was for reasons that seemed more to have to do with implementations or people's personal preferences. Next, please. So yeah, so there's, there was sort of two general kinds of changes. One are additions, um, stuff that's backwards compatible. Um, some are simply changes, stuff that's incompatible with what's in the, in the current document. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> sorry. but anyway, since we started publishing RFCs, all the changes have been backwards compatible. The, cur the current version of XML to RFC will, re will, will render every published RFC. So for practical purposes, we're talking, you know, the, the current three, the, the current, whatever, the, the current 3.x that XML to the RFC implements, we can consider that to be the language that all RFCs to date have been published in. I mean, the earlier ones didn't use some of the features that were added later, but, the, but those features didn't break anything. Next. So there were a lot of what I call typesetting changes. Um, there is a, there's a, there, there's an, an unfixable, <clears throat> there's an unfixable tension between people who want our XML to be purely semantic, simply to describe, um, you know, this, 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 is, this is a diagram and this is a section and people who want to do typesetting is like, I want to indent stuff by three spaces and I want, you know, and I want this to be bigger and I want this to be in italics. And so um, the original language tended more towards the semantic side and there's been a lot of additions to make, to, to allow more, control over, over the, the specific formatting. You know, an example is the, the T element, which is for paragraphs. Um, now lets you put in a specific indent. You know, whereas before, if you wanted to do specific indents, you had to fake it with nested unnumbered lists, which everybody agreed was silly. So we added the, 
So we ad ad added the indent, even though it's not entirely clear what it means to indent by three somethings when you have multiple output formats. Next, please. Um, there were also some actual semantic changes, um, which I will discuss in, in slightly more detail. Um, there's the always exciting postal element, which was added um, later. Um, there's the way the links are handled, and there's the way we handle Unicode. Next, please. So, um, what are the, we need to decide what we're, what we're going to do. We need to mean we need to decide are are how many of these changes are we going to keep? And I think the answer is going to be most of them. Um, are there things that were that are clearly mistakes that we should back out? Are there things that we were that are mistakes that we, should, that we need to do in a different way? And are there things that we should be doing that we aren't doing yet? And I think there might even be a few of those. So if if, if this sounds like I'm I'm proposing changes to the XML, yes, I am, but per the boss here, we'll, we'll argue about those a little later. Next, please. So yeah, the, the formatting changes are basically harm. You know, I, I'd say in some cases I have, I have my doubts whether it's really, whether it's, it's really useful in our, in our environment to try to have such perfect control over one format, even though it's not necessarily gonna look as good in other formats, but it's there, I don't think it hurts anything. And there's a whole bunch of new elements. Um, and as far as I can tell, other than Postal, I think they're all actually reasonable. Next, please. So here are some things that I think, I think are actually done wrong. Um, and I'm going to go through them here, um, starting with Postal. And there's a, some other odds and ends that I think people will recognize. So next, please. So the... <clears throat> I talked to the guy who impl implemented Postal, and he explained what his what his what his reasoning was, and I didn't understand it. So anyway, we have this very complicated way to put in postal addresses, where you can put in the street, and you can put in the city, and you can put in the subregion, and, and all this stuff. And the problem is that to format these, it requires to use it requires a library that somebody at Google wrote several years ago and abandoned, and it's out of date, and it's and it's and it has it has mistakes in it, and there's endless pull requests that will never be never be updated, so that Fortunately, all of the addresses we have so far have haven't run into these implementation bugs. But this is basically a time this this is basically a time bomb. You know, this is depending on a library that that is already dead and is not going to get any better. And someday we're going to run into an address that uses um, if an address from somewhere in a in, in a place where the library is wrong, and then we'll be stuck. So the way to fix it is actually simple. Next line, please. Okay, which is simply say you know. We're not the Universal Postal Union, and an address is simply a list of lines. So, like, his, this is and this is actually a real address from an RFC. Um, so, in this case, it's got you know it's, the first line is the business park, the second one is the city and the postcode, because that turns out to be how you format stuff in India. And then there's the the state, and then we leave country at the end because um, people have told me that it is useful to be able to go through and collect statistics on on uh, what countries people are from. And I am not proposing that we have a master list of countries. We just do something reasonable. So this would require going through and basically formatting everything, running everything through the formatting code one last time and turning them into post line. I know how to do this. It wouldn't be too hard. You have a question? You just, no, okay. All right. Next, please. Okay. This really, I think, is just a bug. Um, in the RFC element at the top, there is a doc name field in internet drafts, it is the name of the draft. Um, in RFCs, it is still the name of the draft. And I think that's just, that was just an oversight. So um, several people have suggested to me that the document name in the RFC should be the RFC. And, if the, and, if, and in response to the obvious question, well, then how do you know what draft it used to be? There's a separate link element, which I display down at the bottom, that tells you what draft it used to be. And that's not going to go away. Um, so this. I think this is basically just a bug, a bug that we should fix, and it makes it would make indexing a little easier, and it would certainly avoid a lot of confusion, where like the document name actually isn't draft blah blah, the document name actually is RFC ninety four zero five. So I would like to fix this. So Torres is in the queue. Does he yep. have? Yeah, you, you want to if you want to do questions on this particular slide, go right uh, ahead. On, on the previous slide, a comment. Oh, okay. Sure. The post line. Sorry, I was slow. Okay, if you can go back. Yeah. Um, would it would it be useful to have in the tag itself, you know, one of these? I'm not sure what the what they're called, right? When you say uh, post line, um, 
semantic equal string and then um, the old uh, tag name. So no, that it would not. We, I, I, <clears throat> the semantic, nobody has ever been able to explain to me why it is useful. For, I mean, the only reason to have a postal address is so that, like, if you want to send somebody, you know, I don't know, a letter, you, 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 can, you can send it to them. Um, like, we're not, we're not doing analyses on what post office box no, no, people use. No, but the use. whole point is, why shouldn't the, we don't need to do it for any of, we don't need to use that option there for any of our rendering. But if the author feels strongly that, you know, they come from a particular region, the particular lines are called the following, why shouldn't they insert that information? Why, kind it's, of, it's, why, why forbid <laughs> metadata? Because it's useless complication. But anyway, I think, with, I think this is getting off over, we're, we're getting off on a tangent here. I mean, I think I, I, under, okay. I understand you think that would be a good idea. I think it's a terrible idea. We're not going to resolve it right now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Julian, what uh, slide did you want to talk to? Actually, actually both. Um, so this one okay. and the next. So if, uh, just one comment about the postal line. I agree mostly on what John just said. Um, I just wanted to point out that these specific elements under postal have been there forever. But before the re-implementation of XML to RFC, they were ordered as if this was an, a US address. So the change that actually was made was changing the display of that information based on the country name. And that's where that library came in. <clears throat> And on the document name slide, um, I think the obvious fix is not to have a doc name if it's an RFC because it duplicates the RFC number, which is already in there. Yeah, that would be reasonable too. Yeah. And with yeah. respect to the link, um, I know that we, I think we say this is mandatory, but that doesn't make any sense because you can compute the link from the RFC number and data tracker will redirect you to the correct page. So it's completely pointless information. It may, may have been useful five years ago, but nowadays data tracker knows uh, about what drafts led to a, con a concrete RFC. So we are just stuck. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, you're right. Although that adds a dependency on the data tracker, which may or may not be good, but we can certainly keep it in mind. Alexis? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to that. I think it's valuable to keep the link there to Data Tracker exactly for that reason, in case the Data Tracker dependency goes away at some point. It gives us a, an artifact to see the draft. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, All right. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. We, we... But Martin Martin Thompson, who Martin didn't put Thompson, himself in the but, queue, but yeah, yes. because it's like the new the, the new thing, and I can't make sense of it. Um, but if the data tracker goes away, then the target of the link goes away too. It's hard to argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but way back. Exactly. Robert. Take us out of the weeds. The yeah. important thing with the proposed change is that somehow the RFC still ends up with the draft name, the string of the draft name that it came from. Thank you. Right now it's embedded in a link. We could have a different proposal that, you know, it's just a piece of metadata that, and yeah, other things can figure out what to do with it. Thank you. Yes. Let's, Agreed. let's yeah. get a, whoever has a proposal along these lines, let's get them on the list to John and Paul and, see if we can sort which is the uh, best way to approach this. Yeah. All right, good, good. Yeah, but actually one thing this does remind me is that there's a, there's a fair number of decisions that are sort of intertwined with our tooling. And this comes up later in uh, with includes too, next. Um, the original um, RFC said you can basically hardly put Unicode anywhere because at the time, Unicode support was still pretty iffy in web browsers and, and PCs and stuff like that. That was then, this is now. Um, now I think it's reasonable to expect any web browser will have fairly complete Unicode support, at least for sort of widely, widely used languages that people actually speak, if not necessarily for things like Aramaic. Um, 
there was a new element U for displayed Unicode, um, which actually it puts in the Unicode, and there's some options so you can actually you can uh, you know it puts in the, the 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 character names and stuff like that, and that's useful where where you actually want to where the actual code code points are important. We have um, given the RPC discretion to allow Unicode pretty much any, everywhere, and they get to figure out um, what makes sense. There's still some open questions like here, x squared less than or equal ev. Um, those are actually all Unicode characters. I think it's okay to use them. You know, do, do we, we want to allow inline math? Maybe. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to decide it here. But actually, that is sort of the the, the definition of what characters are allowed where is not actually in the in the in the um, the XML grammar. It's it's more a matter of what the implementation allows. Oh, and fi and finally, there is a con there's a contact field which is intended for people's names, but people keep attempting to abuse it to sneak in Unicode because it's the only it used to be the only way to do Unicode without displayed stuff. Torlis, uh, uh, before Torlis, I, I do think um, the RSAB I believe has um, given an interpretation currently that. Um, the RPC should continue to limit Unicode in certain ways. And so I think if we want to be explicit about guidance, we probably have to give it yeah. um, as the RSWG Torless. Would, would uh, there be a way to say here is a, an ASCII 7-bit escape notation for rendering where you don't, you know, or cannot or do not want to uh, use that, for example, if you go to Braille or anything like that where you may have problems um, so an escape notation, right? Either for a single character or for kind of a, so an alternative yeah. of some sort. We we have that in URLs and everything, right? So in, in in terms of well, is it for accessibility or is it for for? I, I think for, accessibility for, might be might be one of the reasons. Yeah I, I, yeah, I think accessibility is an important issue, and it's way more complicated than this. So I think we should, you know, if, if we want, if we want to do something for with accessibility, I think we should do it with accessibility, and not just and not just try to do it one tiny hack at a time. I mean, for example, there's a big issue with accessibility of like, if you have a line drawing, you know, you, you know, there's no braille version of a line drawing. Right, yeah. but just, just, just because there are more and more problems, why shouldn't we offer one simple solution for one, uh, one simple option, which is you would like to have things look nice with, um, you know, specific things like formulas or other, and you, of course, also know some crappy ASCII 7-bit uh, alternative uh, uh, notation. And uh, because, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I think one of the, yeah. I think the short answer to your question is, and this is going to go a little to the discussion we have at the end, we're, as a group, supposed to sort of make broad policy um, and not just sort of um, implementation choices for the RPC. So I think if we can come up with something that looks like a policy that the RSAB can interpret and say, yes, we should have alternatives to text in this particular way, um, we don't want to engineer in here. We want to make a policy statement about what we want, um, you know, uh, RFCs in the XML to look like. But I think this gets into the discussion we're going to have in a little bit. Um, Paul? Can we not do the mic line on this? This one in specific is the draft that you mentioned earlier that we, we are for, we yeah. are down to uh, two minutes left for this supposedly. So um, yeah, Jay, quickly. Yeah, very, very quickly. So I think we're conflating a couple of bits here. So the, the change that's come through the RSAB is that if you read um, 7997 um, with what it says about Unicode and compare it to the current implementation, the current implementation is overly restrictive. And so it, it goes beyond what 7997 says. And so what that's just been confirmed through the RSAB, that that's the case. And so that over restriction is being removed. Okay, um, But when we start talking about things like the, the maths and that kind of stuff, that's actually now going beyond 7997. And so that's the sort of hard line there where we you know where the RSWG is involved and where it isn't involved, I think. Thanks, okay. that helps. Next. Um, Phil? Well. Very quickly, expanding the Unicode is very welcome to me, and specifically because I do a lot of math stuff. And when you've got one spec that was published outside the uh, IETF and you're explaining how to use it in another way and it is written in math, you only introduce confusion by having to introduce a whole set of new numbers and letters or whatever 
to refer to, you have to change the nomenclature. Yeah. And that's just a disaster. Yeah, I mean, to, to try to only stick my foot a little bit into the tar pit, I mean, but by doing, with, with, with inline Unicode, you can do, you know, you, basically you can do this. You can do superscripts and listing. If you want to do full math with, you know, integrals and, and stuff, for that, for that you need SVG, you know, and that's, that's, a, that's another discussion. Next, please. Um, is another question is what to do about the prep tool. The, it was, it's pretty clear when, when the prep tool was designed, the idea was that you would run the prep tool once, it would then um, annotate the uh, annotate the XML, and then you would then you would render the then you would you would render the, the that, that that prepped X, XML several times in, into multiple formats. Um, in fact, we only do that once when the RFC is actually published. Other than that, um, uh, the, the, the way XML RFC is written, it it basically does a prep and rendering in one in in one pass. You know, so you know, given that, is it useful to still have a, a separate prep tool? I think it is. And it's like Robert's pointed this out, is that it, it, it sort of nails things down so that rendering will be consistent, like the paragraph numbers won't change from one rendering to another. To make the prep, to, for the pre benefit of the prep tool, there are a couple of new elements, like the TOC element, which is fine. It says, here's the table of contents that was created by the prep tool. Um, unfortunately, another change is that there's, a, it's, to put the authors at the end, there's a quick hack that basically says, well, I'll put it in a section, which means that you know you need to be able to put an author in a section, so that although in practice authors only appear in this in the author section at the end, the grammar allows you to put an author in a section anywhere, which is ridiculous because that's not what authors are for. So I'm I think that's another thing we should fix just by adding like an author list element that only goes at the end. Um, and I think there are maybe some other minor issue. Oh, and and other yeah another next slide for the rest of the prep tool. Um, we're constantly discovering that users don't don't understand what the prep tool does. Julian suggested that XML has namespaces. It would be a good idea to put the elements that the prep tool creates into a separate prep tool namespace to make it clear, like this is this is this is for these elements are for are for for computers, not for human beings. And also make it easier to unprep stuff because you can simply strip those out and then sort of remove the remove the remove elements that have defaults where this explicit value is the same as the default. But things would make stuff a lot easier. And there's also a question with our tools. You know, it's like prepping is actually kind of slow. So would it be worth fixing XML to RFC so you could say prep it once and then render into two formats? I don't know. Might be. So um, Elliot, and if you could quite quickly, although I, I would. Think I only have one or two slides. So yeah, yeah, I think so too. Yeah. I would urge folks, uh, as Julian mentioned in the chat room, um, you know, uh, the comment was, I disagree with most of the slide, but we should probably take this to the, you know, issues list. Um, th that would be a preferred way to do that, but please do uh, jump in, Elliot. Okay, so um, actually, uh, I'll make it even simpler. Uh, Pete, could you put a pin in these two slides for your later discussion and, and, and John, so that we bring them up as to an example of, you know, whether this is policy or implementation? And we don't have to discuss it now. I just want to put a pin in it for later, okay? Thank you. Okay. Karsten? Yeah, I just, someone was wrong on the microphone. Um, we do use author elements uh, in the back matter in the contributor section. Um, you don't know anything about the contributor section, but th that is added by crammed on RF RFC if you have a contributor. And uh, since author elements don't work there, we use the contact element, which is identical to the author element, uh, except that it's called contact. Yeah, it's a good point, but something, okay. But I think my point here is I, I would like to adjust the grammar so that what it allows actually matches better what people, what we want to allow people to do. So if we're going to put authors in the contributor section, that's fine. We can fix it, fix it to make that work. All okay, right, next. two more slides. Yeah. Three more. Um, there's an overall issue that we've been scratching our head, heads about. The way the, there are play, <clears throat> the, the rules about what, what elements and contains what others, what sub elements seems kind of arbitrary and there are constant places that Karsten keeps reminding us of where you can allow an element is allowed in one context but not in another context it seems like it should be the same and and yeah 
and uh, yeah, Peter and I were both both tried very hard to find time to see if we could r r rationalize this, and we and we haven't done it yet. So yeah, the concrete pr proposals have been coming real soon now for a year. I think if we fix this, we'll basically allow more more things in more places, so the changes will be upward compatible, so they wouldn't be very painful. But it's it's also a place. But yeah, you know, we need to review, make sure we actually understand the semantics of why do we allow stuff where. And I think I got one more. Yeah, and there's odds and ends. Um, our rules for SVG don't work. Um, there, um, and there's a whole separate discussion about that. Um, the grammar um, <coughs> contemplated bitmap artwork. We've never allowed it, but actually, I think it might be a re it might be reasonable to allow it because you know you can you know embedded bitmaps and web pages do work. Um, the way the the way the, the link was implemented is just different from what the spec says. We either need to fix the spec or fix the code. And there's also, and this is this is more the tooling, but how do includes work and like where where do they where do they find things? Because there's a lot, yeah, that's 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 a whole can of worms of making making includes work. I don't know to what extent that would be in the grammar and to what extent that's nailing down stuff in the tools. And I think this is my last slide. Oh yeah. So what do we do? Um, <clears throat> I can we can publish the draft more <clears throat> more or less as it is now that, that as a snapshot of what the code does now we can do we can clean stuff up to what we are happy with with a 3.1 and publish that we could publish both or we could decide that this is just a working document and not publish it and just leave it as a draft and this really is my last slide it is okay I think I'm still a QR code. Oh, no, there we go. That's there we go. Right. Okay. Um, so this is a brief presentation on the draft that that is a working group draft. Um, the basic idea is seven, RFC 7990 was the overarching um, document for all of the changes. So it says things like, we will do this, we won't do this. Um, so there are going to be some slides in here that we're not going to have the mic line on because they're actually very much related to um, what Martin's going to be presenting later. But since however we do the discussion of when do we change, what parts of the um, uh, format, how does that affect renderings and such like that, we'll have to come into 7990-BIS um, but that doesn't mean we have to have that discussion in this presentation. Next, please. Um, so it just quickly, it was adopted by the working group. We had a zero, zero draft. Um, lots of the discussion in June and July were um, about topics that might be in the future of this. We may end up deciding to not do a straight 7990 BIS, but something that actually covers more. That is, now that we have a picture of the sort of larger things that are going on in the series, we might actually not call it 7990 BIS, but you know, the new process or something like that. Um, and again, all the questions about regenerating, when do we do and such like that, will be after next. Next. Um, one of the things in the, so now the next couple slides are comments that have happened on the mailing list. Um, we started talking about, you know, this is where canonical format is defined. Again, we don't need to discuss it right now, but Mark Nottingham started a thread about this um, that said the definition that we have in the draft doesn't actually specify who's performing the actions and um, just the use of the word canonical for a particular version and such, what does that mean? That'll come up later. Um, uh, 7990 originally assumed that there would be some evolution. Um, and it said then, you know, like if there was an error discovered in the format of the XML for an RFC, and then Mark Nottingham asked, well, what does an error mean? You know, is it an interpretation? Is what so we need to either nail that down or remove it from seven nine nine zero bis. 
um, but that will have to be discussed. It should actually be discussed after we have the following discussion on regeneration, because some people, uh, look, many people here are engineers, so if we see a way to fix a thing, we try to backtrack that into the definitions we have. Um, but the RFC series is going to last for many, many more decades. 7990 is a way to move forwards for those decades. We now have a more refined picture of how that would work. Instead of trying to backtrack into what we did before, it really should be forward looking. So something like where we say, what is an error? Instead of just trying to make it look like what we wanted before, it really should be a general long-term thing. Next. Um, so next steps is there should be more discussion. I should have said more discussion on the mailing list. Um, and then as this happens, the chairs have to call for consensus and declared consensus so that um, both the previous draft and my draft and whether Martin's draft is going to exist separately or not, all of those can be moved. People can see where we're going. Because one of the things I've, I've spent some time last night looking at the mailing list discussions, not only do we cycle a lot, but people, someone will suggest something that people think that's great. And then we'll assume that it's already a given and then we'll be doing diffs off of that. Weeks pass and nothing is instantiated anywhere. A month passes and people come back looking at the draft and such. We need to actually get consensus put in drafts so that the discussion, because remember, many people in this discussion are thinking, I know what they're talking about because I've written RFCs for the last 30 years. I know what they're talking about is incorrect, specifically because you've been writing RFCs for the last 30 years. We're talking about the new way to do things. So that was my last slide. Okay, and a good layup for Martin who, against my better judgment, is about to wake you up merely by formatting. If you can't do it well, do it really, really badly. <laughs> That's how we operate here, right? Yeah, let's go, go on. All right, so um, we've had a a lot of debate back and forth about what it is that can change and what can't change. And I'll probably get the terminology wrong here and I apologize to Martin uh, in advance for that one. Uh, oh, I will eat the mic. Okay. Um, so. Much better. Yeah. Uh, we'll work it out. I, I took a look at RFC 7990 and it says this, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the publication formats in, in relation to that. And I found that a little, little uh, distressing uh, because there are no, there's no, no really clear direction from that document um, on this particular question. So I guess that means we get to decide. Next, please. Uh, so I just want to get out, out up front. Um, the sort of three general classes of things that, we ge that we're sort of talking about in this context. Um, the, the notion of canon uh, as it relates to the RFC series, um, the authority that is carried by the publication of an RFC, um, the, um, the capturing of ITF consensus for an ITF stream document and, and so on. Um, and, and then there's all, all of the archival considerations that um, uh, relate to all of these things. So uh, I think we can probably have to knock off each one of these things as we go through the, the discussion here. Next. So um, in discussions about this particular point, I think a number of people have raised the, the concern. Well, when, <clears throat> obviously, to John's point earlier, uh, let's just start with the XML. Um, we can talk about the publication formats as a consequence of, of that. Um, it seems like it would be inevitable if we change XML that the publication formats would need to change as well. So um, let's start with the XML. Next, please. So in, in talking to a number of people in this one, I think there's a, 
very important distinction to, to be had between the way in which the, the intent of the authors is expressed in XML and the intent itself. And uh, to, the, to the greatest extent possible, if we are intending to change the way in which documents express the, the author's intent, we need to make sure that the authority that is captured in the publication of a, an RSC is retained through any changes that occur. So if we go back and we change the address lines, we need to, we need to be confident that those changes don't undermine the, uh, the intent of, of the authors and the authority that that document captures as a result of, of it being published. So um, obviously the, the address line thing is probably easy. Uh, it's going to be a little challenging when we talk about TT elements or, or other things like that. Um, I, I mentioned here, <clears throat> we use XML specifically because it is a, a very explicit way to, to capture semantics. And if we change it, we may also inadvertently change some of the author, authorial intent, or at least the uh, intent of the streams as they uh, published a document. On the other hand, syntax changes are a good thing potentially because it means that we can ensure that the syntax for RFCs is consistent across the series. Uh, one, of the, one of the things we've found to be quite difficult is already we're seeing some amount of divergence in the way that uh, XML is used across, uh, across time because we're learning how to use it better or we're refining processes and um, that's, that's good, but it means that anyone consuming the series now has to understand the plethora of different ways in which documents are expressed. And it, it would be better, I think, in my opinion, to have a consistent expression um, so that the, the semantics are clear throughout the series without having to, to know that this particular document was published with this particular set of sem uh, semantic meanings attached to the elements, and this one was um, published with a different set of semantic meanings attached to the elements. So um, there is that. Next, please. As I mentioned, not always clear. Um, so the document that I've published in the last two days, I think it was, I, I wrote that during a working group session when I was trying to pay attention to other things, so there may be errors in there, um, says the future RSWG is, is empowered to, to change the, the definition of the format, what John was talking about. And... Um, it also says that the RSWG can describe a process for changing existing published XML, provided that they exercise good judgment and to the greatest extent possible, preserve the semantics that uh, were captured in that document. Now, that's gonna be difficult, but we have some worked examples of things where we think we can probably get away with it. Um, that may be an expansion uh, in order to make, maintain compat compatibility to the point that John made earlier. So that's good. Uh, next, I think, yeah, this is really a slide teeing up a question. So uh, I think this is where we're at right now. And it's probably a good time to have a discussion. I don't think I have anything more after this one. Oh, no, 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 there's one, that, yeah, that, that is a, another point that's, that's in the draft. Okay. If we just jump forward to that, uh, that archival um, slide, uh, the, the document also talks about archival, uh, establishes requirements for archival of the XML documents. It does not establish any requirements for the archival of publication formats. It specifically points out that if, if tooling changes, you can regenerate the publication formats and that's fine. Uh, whether or not those get archived at that point in time is an implementation decision. Uh, I, I would kind of expect that they would be archived periodically. Maybe they'll, they'll not be archived every single time uh, to allow for the fact that maybe there were mistakes and we discover mistakes and let's, let's not archive that version, that sort of thing. And but, there are two more slides you want to go back on. Uh, yeah, let's, let's look at the next one. I forget oh, what it, uh, sorry. 
I forget where it is. Oh, yes. So the consequence of that is that you can generate them whenever, whenever deemed appropriate. Yeah, Robert likes this. Oh, and, and um, this, this is my backup slide. Um, unfortunately, the original, this one had animations. Um, uh, we, can, we can thank Medeco for saving you from that one. But that, 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 that goes through some of the problems that exist in the, the publication formats as a result of the, the policy n never, to, never to change them. So, Jay, take it away, Jay. <laughs> I might jump in line rather than yeah, yeah. stand up here. That's fine. Um, thank you, Martin. So the key word for me in your presentation there was about was preserving. Um, I think that w what we've always understood or what people understand is that anything that happens to an RFC has to preserve the original intent or the original, yeah, the original intent of when it was um, first written. Um, and I think if you start from that first principle that is actually drives a number of things um not just what you're talking about there it drives the um the the, the semantic bit that um it's possible to enhance the xml do things to the xml because they will not be changing the original intent okay um the other thing that which is my particular bugbear is i is that we publish documents that we know are wrong, that we have somebody tell us they're wrong, we have verified it, we've gone through a thorough process that says we know that's wrong and we've documented the wrongness, but we still, you know, as errata, but we still publish that document. And to me, that is actually the opposite of preserving, uh, of the principle of preservation, okay? And so if we start with that principle of preservation, I think it should lead us to the view that we should be adding the errata as well and regenerating those documents, for, including the XML, you know, in order to incorporate that or those errata and working that way forwards. That to me is providing correctness, maintaining the, the preservation. It is helping the people who actually implement it. Um, I think, you know, the, 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 the immutability that we've got needs to be dissected and uh, a set of principles put in place to, re um, to replace it. The preservation is the, the good one to start off with and then drive that sort of change down from that point onwards. So thanks, Martin. So, and maybe Martin wants to address this, but my interpretation, and this goes to a comment or two that's being made in the chat room, my interpretation was that the desire for preservation was preservation of the semantics expressed in the XML, right? So not the intent of the working group on a particular technical no, I, I was, topic. I was picking that word out. Right. So, so there's, you know, there's a question of, um, the group intended to label this as source code in a particular language because that's what it was. It was A, B, and F. It was Yang. Um, that's a semantic that is carried in that XML that we need to preserve going forward. Now, errata are a different layer of semantic to me, at least different than what I heard Martin talking about. And I, no, I think it's a I reasonable no, point I of discussion. I agree with you. I'm yeah. suggesting that this is a, what Martin we could is extend. a subset. No, it's a subset. Yeah. And while it's useful, it's, it's a, bluntly, a trivial subset in comparison to the bigger issue here, which is incorrect documents. Um, do you want to address that, Martin, or Paul's up next? Yeah. <clears throat> Just briefly. Uh, the intent of this was to just start with that subset. I think that I'd be supportive of someone trying to explore the the, the larger question of of errata, but I I wanted to see if we could get this much, just this much done. Paul, go ahead. Um, so two things here. I'll do it in, in reverse order. I like what Jay's saying, but not when he is saying it. I believe that that. I mean, it's going to be a giant pin, but I think that should be done later for exactly why Martin said that. 
Um, but the reason why I put myself in the queue is I think we end up tripping a lot over something that I had mentioned in my slides, Martin mentions his, is canonical. We are used to having that word around and such like that, and I think it is now getting in our way big time. So a possibility is that we simply remove the concept of canonical. We go to, as Jay said, first principles, which is why are people reading them? How, you know, how do we make them and such like that? That may make this whole set of stuff move forwards faster instead of trying to come up with a more interesting way of defining canonical. Because quite frankly, 99% of the people reading RFC 9123 don't know what canonical means. So 1% does and maybe cares, but the RFC series is for the readers of the RFCs. And if we are getting stuck on a concept that isn't important to them, and getting unstuck might make better RFCs. I think we should go that way. Phil. Uh, I agree mostly with what Jay was saying. Uh, just throwing out something that might upset folk, versioning. Mm. I mean, really, You've got the zero, the dot zero version of the uh, thing of, of the RFC, which is when it was originally print, printed. I would very much like to be able to pull, pull up uh, RFCs with the errata included, but I also, in my expert witness thing, I need to be able to occasionally go back to what the, it originally said. And so I think that you need to capture both pieces of information. And the obvious way of doing that would be with um, a version number. And if people want to have the purest originally printed, they can always go for the dot zero. And it would also allow us to do things like tweak the XML to meet some new criteria. You know, that would be a, a sort of errata. And to reiterate <clears throat> on Paul's pin, and it keeps getting bigger and fatter, um, there becomes an additional question here about where the line between presentation and canonical archival preserving semantic intent goes. And so I think we can all imagine instances where there are presentation formats of errata versus archival formats which preserve the old and versioning formats. Some of those might be implementation questions. Some of them might be policy questions. And I think this is sort of the, the joint that Martin's trying to carve here. So um, anyway, appreciate it. And the, the, the pin keeps getting uh, stronger here. Uh, Karsten. I want to pick up on the, on the term intent once more. Um, I think the RFC series is a very special series because the point of the IETF and I think pretty much all the other streams is to run various consensus processes. So we have consensus about content and or consensus about fitness to publish. And actually, when you look at the documents, there is no intent. There is only consensus. I mean, except maybe for the absolutely simplest documents that were just written, accepted by everyone, and then published. But all technical development results in consensus and not in intent. <coughs> you will never get the band back together that had the consensus. So and any post facto changes will stay stay um, something like, like a, a scar on, on that document. Uh, but I think that that's uh, not a big problem. We just have to uh, understand that this is the case. Um, and um, the other observation is uh, the consensus is built around renderings, not around the source. So the, the XML source actually doesn't matter, <laughs> which is, uh, when you think about it, a pretty surprising 
uh, revelation, but it, it's actually true when you follow this line of reason. All right, Martin, you are in the queue. Yeah, Martin Thompson, I'm going to disagree slightly, slightly with Carsten. I think uh, in a lot of cases we're, we're building consensus around markdown uh, rather than the, the final artifact, um, which, which is, I think, a, a, a very powerful tool. So um, that, that's worth, uh, worth talking through as well. Uh, I just wanted to sort of get up and highlight that, that there are possibilities for things that we could change that I don't think affect authorial in, intent or even the uh, expression of um, uh, authority and agreement that's captured in a document. One of the things that I see the RPC routinely do is, is fix line wrapping in various ways. And um, they do that using a particular set of tools. And we might find in, during the discussions here, we find uh, alternative ways of managing that and going back and retroactively uh, fixing those things would be an, an interesting option that, that this change would, would make it available to us. And I think that that's, that's the sort of thing that I'm talking about in terms of changing the XML. The other, the other sort of thing is uh, taking an existing element that has uh, multiple different semantics as expressed through combinations of attributes and, and defining that to use different elements instead. That would be another thing that we could do that I don't think changes the semantic intent of a document. So um, I just want to put some, some of these examples out there as, as possibilities. I see a lot of people in, in the chat saying, well, you can't change the document. Uh, I don't think in practice people agree to the, the XML as Carsten said. And so we, we have some flexibility there. Elliot. This is a great conversation. Um, and thank you, Martin, uh, for, you know, you're, you're never shy about, you know, taking on these big uh, questions and hitting the nail head on. Um, I, it's just really a, a pleasure to, to participate in, in this sort of uh, discussion. I think, um, though, Paul really uh, articulated something that I think is worth exploring quite a bit, which is why do we need canonical anything? Um, and thinking of, I, and, and, and he got my head spinning right there. You know, if we think about the purpose of the series, principally it's around interoperability, right? We want to make sure that, that interoperability is maintained. Um, and when we talk about canonical, from a reader's perspective, the thing you would like to avoid is a situation where you have the HTML version seemingly indicating one thing in an example or something like that. Perhaps it's you know a rendering problem, and PDF showing something else. Uh, just as a case in point, um, at the end of the day, the question is: Is it you know we're not the UN? Right? Do we have to have a canonical format? Do we have to have an editorial committee like every UN function has that debates between the six UN languages to make sure that everything is equivalent? And um, and if there's a dispute, right? It's the French version, right? We don't. We may not need that for our purposes. And I certainly I do not agree with you, Martin, that most developers and and participants in the ITF. Uh, really get into the discussion of Markdown, I really do think it is the render format. And we could ask people what they think about that. But it also brings perhaps uh, forward another issue, which is what, what we as the, the people who write the, the, these things use versus what people who read them use. And I don't want to go any further than that. I think this is a great conversation. Um, and I, I think it's a, a great a start of a great discussion that I think we'll have for a little while. Thanks. Alexis. 
uh, I think it would be useful to look at redefining and considering whether we continue to use words like canonical and archival. I really would prefer to do that in the larger context of an archival policy document rather than trying to make that a gating factor for being able to make forward progress on this, the thing that we have in front of us, um, changing XML. From my perspective, the only thing we really need to consider before we say yes to this is uh, whether we prefer something like versioning versus dating files or something like that, like the, the actual, how are we gonna preserve things? Um, I, just, I don't think we should make this, a, this conversation a gating factor for whether we move forward. Good point, thank you. Robert. Robert Sparks, the queue got so deep that I'm um, now got many conflated things and we'll try to pull them back apart. Um, anecdotes, republishing the rendered formats. If we discovered that for some reason we needed to change the fonts that we use in the PDF format in particular, because the fonts are embedded there, um, being able to re-render backwards so that fonts were consistent across all of the, the things would be, you know, just consider that as a use case in line with what Martin called out with the underlying libraries change and we can change the way line breaks behave, right? It's more fodder for we should just be able to replace the rendered formats almost at will. So um, I will add a little bit of weight to the big pin on the wall around the errata. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, the inline errata rendering experiment that we ran on the text formats if you read the code and you read some of the results of what that code produces, you discover that the errata's content that we have is not always in a form that you can, even if approved, you can just go make a simple change to the document that retains the intended semantics of it, right? particularly when the errata is something that changes like A, B, and F, or um, the many of them are not written in a before, after kind of format so that they can be injected. So there's going to be a number of those where trying to present the, here's what we really meant, will wade very deeply into um, the question of whether or not it preserves the intent of the original publication the, or not. The, the reason there's a big giant pin in errata for me um, is I think exactly this issue uh, um, opening up the question of whether errata ought to be applied in some way in presentation in, in the original it, it opens up the question of the entire errata system now and how it's used and I think it's an interesting question. It's one that we would have to drag the stream heads into, you know, and, and a big broader audience. And it's a big, um, big hairy mess. Um, Jay, go ahead. I'll give you an optimism pill later. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, canonical is, um, is, a, is a difficult word for us, isn't it? Because it does imply, as someone wrote on the list that, if you're not sure, that's the one that you go back to to check. And asking someone to go back to check XML is um, perhaps not that user friendly. Um, what it actually is, is the source file. Um, because we know that all of the other representations are generated from that source file. We know that some of the rep representations cannot include everything that is in the source file. Um, and we know that some of those representations sometimes are wrong um, because they've unintentionally um, missed out or um, uh, somehow messed up something from the source file. So that's probably 
the better way forward for us to think about it is source. Now, I don't know what that means for canonical in terms of where people go to understand what is the definitive one that they need to, to read, um, should there be a difference between the two of them. But it, it does imply that the process, if there's a difference, is to regenerate from the source as necessary to ensure that there is no difference. You know, um, the, 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 the second point was about Martin's point about consensus. Um, we actually have um, two formats now. Um, we have an authoring format and we have a publication format. And if you look at um, Martin's example, we're extending the authoring format to not just be one version of the XML, but also to be marked down as well. Um, and I don't think we are ever going to get past that issue of the boundary of consensus um, between the um, authoring format and the publication format, so long as we have two separate formats in that way. And I, I personally think we should carry on with those two separate formats because there are a number of reasons for them. So there are already some established processes for dealing with that boundary. The Auth 48 process is one there. Um, there are some things that take place within um, uh, uh, last call and um, IESG work and those sort of things that um, and they, that have mechanisms for addressing that. So it, it, we can continue to work with that boundary between those two formats. Um, I don't think that we have to, you know, I don't think that the worry about consensus should mean that we can't somehow um, achieve that. Anyway. Go ahead, Paul. Um, I'll do the same thing I did last time since I'm following Jay. I like what Jay just said about if we get rid of canonical, you know, and, and think of the formats, it's good. Um, I put my hand in the queue um, about the big thing that I really want us to consider later because we keep saying, oh, it's the errata. It's not the errata, it's the updates. So some people in the room know that last year ICANN did a, a project where we took all of the RFCs, we, we marked them up s separately, you know, RFC is here, but you can see annotations on it for the errata and for updates. What we've heard consistently from the people who are using them is, oh my God, I didn't know this had been updated. Even though it says updated maybe at the top, putting an updates in line is extremely helpful. Very, very few errata actually change the technical content of the document almost every updated RFC does. So that's going to, for whatever problems you think there are for inlining the errata are much bigger <laughs> when you start talking about how is this document updated later? Particularly because at least in the DNS world, many of our updates are that old document said should, now it's must. Trying to express that in line is a real pain in the butt, but it's also extremely important. So that's why I would really like to take that whole thought away for now, because I believe that's gonna be a multi-year project that's also going to include lots of mock-ups of how this proposal will look and such like that. And we've got plenty right here to come to consensus on for how are we going to at least let the RFCs change, I'm sorry, how to let an RFC change when someone goes to the RFC editor's website and such like that. So your suggestion, um, uh, I'm just trying to get my head around clarity here. Um, you would prefer not to go down the path that Jay suggests going down and put aside errata with updates with everything else and focus in on the smaller what can be updated in the XML yes. for now? Because the what can be updated in the XML for now leads to the questions that Martin asked, the bright green, orange, yellow questions here, of can you then, can you then um, take that change and get it published in a place that people can see. Once we get a feeling for that and how that happens, then when we know that, that we're going to hit the big peg later with other ones, then we will have 
a better feeling for did the world melt down? Uh, because I believe it won't, but there are people who feel, you know, and have said on the list, everyone expects them to stay the same. I don't think that's true. And if we can start changing them a bit and we don't hear any squawking, then I think we're better off. All right. Thank you. Martin. So um, I'm, I'm less concerned about the, the use of the word canonical than, than others. Um, to me, it, it simply means this is the thing that you get when you type in RFC, ABCD, you know, 9,000 or whatever it is. Um, that's the thing that was, that was used to, to render the thing that you're seeing, because <laughs> ultimately no one's looking at XML anyway. Uh, I, I think that's still a useful concept to have. Elliot. Okay, so um, coming back to uh, this slide. And, and if you can up your gain a bit, if you can, you're a little quiet. Okay, uh, oh, let me see here. I'll take off these guys. That actually helped <laughs> leaning forward. Ah, <laughs> uh, second. I see what's going on here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, that's actually better. Thank you. Okay. Um, coming back to this slide, actually, um, I think there should, you, you might want to think about some granularity here, right? Um, it was interesting how Phil talked about wanting to put, uh, you know, wanting, wanting to preserve equations in RFCs. And one could envision uh, perhaps a future RSWG or somebody saying, hey, let's just incorporate math ML into XML to RFC or some such. Um, so, uh, it's probably worth scoping a little bit in terms of what changes are actually allowed in terms of semantics, right? Um, and, and, you know, there's classic, you know, backward compatible versus, you know, not and, and you know, what and, and that sort of thing. And I think we find that we can be a little more liberal about what XML changes we would allow. And um, I think that's okay. Right. The other thing I would want to just separate out maybe also a little bit is the metadata and how 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 we view that in terms of what changes can be allowed there. Um, it's something that I realize is kicking a little bit of a, a separate hornet's nest, but it's at least worth having that discussion, too. Thank you. Thanks, Elliot. Uh, Alexis. Consider hornet's nest kicked. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I really would want to think long and hard about putting any limitations on how we can change metadata that can lead to some really sticky paths. Um, so I would not want to try to build that into this particular thing. Just say that. Thank you. Uh, Phil? If I were a good chair, I would grab the mic for you and bring it over to where you're taking notes. But what yeah. Um, so we were we were having a discussion on formal methods in IETF, and you know I, I I hadn't realized that you'd expanded the Unicode. So all the RSC, all the drafts I wrote, that I'd had to squash out all the math, I couldn't now bring it back again. Um, I don't actually need integrals to do formal methods. But it seems to me that if we have an effort like that in the ITF, we should not be in a position where 90% of that group's time is spent working out what they can thread through the RFC format. And yes, I've had a very long and painful experience with MathML. I tried to put math into HTML in 1993 I called up Don Newth, and the last email he ever sent to somebody was to me explaining how to do MathML. And, you know, getting that into the browser was a real, you know, it, it was 20 years late. So I, if we're going to do it, you know, if they're going to do that format, I don't think the RFC format should be a roadblock to that type of work. Although, and uh, I'll say for that kind of issue, um, which seems to me, um, you know, more about adding functionality and allowed functionality, 
Um, I'd like to see those kind of proposals end up on the list, either in the form of a document or just an issues list proposal. Um, uh, because I think it's independent of sort of the um, the deeper, uh, broader question that's being asked here, which is where are we going to allow changes to the XML generally? And if we lay that out, where do we want those changes to appear only in new stuff or are we allowing them to backtrack into older XML versions? Um, so appreciated, uh, but yeah, I think those can be dealt with as, as separate line items or, or separate issues. Uh, Martin? Yeah, speaking of separate line items and issues, Alexis, I think you were talking about the metadata that sits outside of the, the documents. We don't want to constrain how we, we manage that. I totally agree. I, there's some metadata in them as well. And um, when you when you entertain the possibility this possibility, you also entertain the possibility of changing things like updates and whatever. I don't want to go there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is just, you know, we we fouled up some of the some of the syntax. We we found a better way of doing it. We want to be able to fix it so that it's all consistent across the series. That's this. Um, Elliot's ideas on exploring those things, I think we, we can do in this group, but we have to get past the first little hump first. So, thank you, Martin. Th this kind of leads me, um, I, I'm, I'm gonna get rid of this slide because it's gonna kill me. Um, sorry. And, and, I, and I do apologize that your fonts didn't come through the tool because it would have made it that much worse for my eyes, but you know, no, thank you. You know, it's morning. Um, but it does lead me to sort of the making progress question. Um, so let's start with the practical of this. I would like to see this discussion um, come to a head relatively quickly because I think a lot of other things will fall out rather quickly if we can come to some sort of agreement here. Um, unfortunately, the, the discussion here seemed to diverge and uh, um, converge repeatedly. Um, so, Martin, do you think that your draft could be made into something that was not just prepared during another working group meeting within the next couple of weeks? It's the sorts of things I'm hearing people complaining about, like the really fine details of just how close we get to must not. Right. In terms of the semantic thing, I, that's something that we'll have to have to negotiate. I think. Yeah. I, I, I've had a conversation with Joel Halpern, who's not here, I don't think, um, and he's noodling on just how. We can Where phrase it is. so we can make it very clear exactly what our intent is in terms of the policy. But uh, aside from that, I've gotten feedback from a number of people who are quite happy with the way that it looks uh, right now. So I, aside from that, those sort of finer points, I, I don't think there's a lot more to do with it. Yeah, Robert? So the number of finer points I think are probably innumerable. I think from the conversation here, you, you could like maybe knock them up as issues on your repo and we can just- If you would turn the mic into you or you into the mic. Yeah. <laughs> I was suggesting that we finish this draft by issues on his repo and just- Yeah, and the reason I'd like you to at least get some of the fine details done and use it as a discussion point in the group. And is the, I didn't even take a look, is the draft named with RSWG somewhere such that the data tracker picked it up? Okay. Um, I, I'd kind of like to get immediate discussion in the next few weeks on where we think we're going and see if we can come to some consensus around the direction, because I do think it changes what will be acceptable changes in XML format. 
um, you know, what will what we or maybe we want to separate it into two and say these are changes for future going stuff these are changes for backward looking stuff i i don't know what the result's going to be but it seems to me that getting consensus on this in the group and getting our heads around it is important um paul did you want to make a comment and then robert so i hate to say this but people always pay more attention when it's a working group document so I propose that, that Martin's document becomes a working group document in its current form almost immediately, simply so that people don't say later, oh, I didn't know if we were really discussing Just to that. make it a target of a discussion, not Absolutely. necessarily published uh, in any finite time. Um, thanks. Uh, Robert? Can we have an interim in early September to finish? Yeah, that's, that was the other thing I was going to get to. Um, you know... I think by way of making progress, we've got to converge on issues like this relatively quickly. And that doesn't seem to happen unless we are face to face, because some of the things even that, you know, John and Paul went over were things that are kind of outstanding and really haven't been discussed on the list for a long time. Um, and getting this nailed down seems really useful. Um, so I would like to entertain the idea of an interim, um, Alexis, before I get down too far down that road. Yeah, Alexis Rossi. Um, I just wanted to say uh, that my way of thinking about this right now, and I wanted to, I guess, check it with the group, is that we won't move forward with Paul's draft, and we will move forward with Martin's draft. Um, yeah, that, I, I mean, that's what I'm hearing. Um, Hector, you were in the queue. Did you mean to be in the queue? Okay, I will unclick you. So instead of clicking back into the queue, yeah. Um, just as for, um, that we would start with Martin's, finish it, and then we would retake up mine, which would, with any of the stuff that's about how things change, would point to the eventual RFC, because there's still other stuff in 799 BIS, 7990 BIS. Um, by the way, Pete, I don't feel like we need a face-to-face. -face. No, 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 okay, no, 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 no. That, that, no, that was not my intent. Online interim was Absolutely. what I was thinking. Um, so, and I'm just going to take a quick, yes. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that was my intent. Sorry about that, Karsten. Yes, you, you got it right. It just <laughs> online. Um, so... Um, so a couple of things on making progress. One thing I've heard from a few folks talking to them this week is that um, th th this seems to be, um, except for the RPC folks, nobody's day job, uh, you know, um, and therefore this kind of gets lost in the list and that the chairs are going to have to do a little more direct arm twisting and pushing things forward. Uh, we, we have heard that, and I, I take that on as a responsibility. I, I, I think it's just going to be the case that um, we're going to have to push and push and push. Um, I, I don't like being the, uh, the director of these things, but um, there you go. Um, I think doing online interims is going to be necessary. The other thing that I heard from, um, I think it was Adrian Farrell, um, you know, we are against a bunch of technical groups schedule-wise when we do these things in person. Um, I don't know if it's even possible or how people feel about it. I know that, for instance, um, was it uh, uh, one of the IAB programs had an 8.30 in the morning meeting um, during IETF week so that it did not conflict with something else. Um, I don't know if we can find non-conflict time during meeting weeks. Robert's giving me a grumpy thumbs down. Um, but, I, you know, part of it, part of the question is, do we have enough of, you know, the people we want in the room when we're doing these things in person? It's not clear that we do, but um, maybe that's just, we're stuck with that and we can just hope for the best that we're not going to be on top of area working groups or something like that. Paul? So we have very few people in the room. We have lots and lots happening on the list. 
this is one of those working groups where, in fact, the face-to-face -face meetings don't have to be as important as the list. Fair enough. I, I think, you know, my concern is for issues like uh, your and Martin's documents that these are tricky, gnarly things to discuss in email um, it, it, just because it will take a lot of email messages. Um, so I would like to at least get some uh, interims going. Elliot, you had a comment? Yeah, this is um, just uh, from from the perspective of having had those interims when we were developing uh, the, the... A little louder, Elliot. Sorry. Uh, this is just from the perspective of having chaired the group when we were developing the model. Um, if you're planning one interim, my suggestion is that you plan two uh, so that you can handle time zone uh, pain and such. Yeah, no, uh, appreciate it. I, I will uh, think in those terms. Um, Phil? Contributing to your steps today. Yeah, just, just to squash that idea that you had about uh, meeting off schedule, whatever, it occurs to me that uh, some of the people who are most vocal on the list are people who are not coming to ITX at all anymore. Oh, yeah, well, there's that too. All right, it was a thought. Um, uh, I'm, 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 I'm hearing the pushback. Uh, so, um, but by way of saying, I've heard these things that I can do to try and force progress forward. Are there other things that people think are necessary to get us moving more quickly? Um, you know, I, I've got chair tasks to take on for sure. Are there other suggestions that people have, Alexis? Uh, so there was a convert, Alexis Rossi, um, there was a conversation in RSAB the other day that I think is useful to report on here, um, as I think it pertains to this conversation, um, where essentially, I'm, I'm going to try to paraphrase, hopefully I don't get it wrong. Um, essentially, I think the message was, uh, when coming up with new ideas, uh, bringing things forward, uh, potentially bringing them to RSAB first to see if there is either existing policy or if RSAB would like to say we think this is policy or it isn't, like it's an implementation detail or something like that, before bringing it to this group, um, which I, I think has the potential to speed things up um, as things would only be brought to this group after that determination was made. Uh, but I also don't feel comfortable that I understand the parameters of RSWG versus RSAB in that context. And uh, to elaborate on that, and then Elliot, uh, you can jump in, but um, I had that <coughs> piece of the conversation in RSAB, I, I started that discussion because I felt like things, questions were coming out of the RPC that sort of mixed together the implementation questions and the policy questions, and I thought, it seems like a better path for RPC to always go to RSAB and say, is this something that's in policy or is this something that, you know, is just an implementation that you guys can decide on and then have RPC sort of be the conduit for most of those questions if they need to be thrown over to the working group with the caveat that if it's policy questions that have broader import, I don't want to discourage the RPC or anyone in, in the RPC from coming over to us directly and saying, hey, this is obviously a policy question, let's talk about this. But that going to the RSAB first is probably uh, an easy way to clean up any um, you know, clarifying questions of that sort. So, um, Elliot, you wanted to make a comment on this? Yeah, um, I think you had it just about right there, Pete. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, right, I think the goal is uh, to facilitate uh, the RPC's work, and, uh, at least from the, my perspective, right? I'm, I'm one person who sits on the RSAP, um, and um, those, of me, those of you who've seen me in the RSAP know that I actually like when the RSAP does no work. Um, this is actually self-interest. But the, um, the, the key points I want to make here, right, is... The art, when we did 9280, we vested a tremendous amount of authority in the RPC to do its job. 
um, or so we thought, right? The RPC may feel differently at times. When they have questions, 9280 tells them to come to the RSAB and ask uh, about the uh, about uh, what authority they have or what questions they have, what they can do, what they can't do. And so they, they are always free to do that. And they did it with the, the it, it, somebody called this a simple example, but I really loved it, how we handled Unicode. Um, you know, we, we, they, they, had an, uh, they, they asked us to interpret for, for, for them the RFCs the, uh, in terms of the rules for including Unicode. And we, we all sort of delved into the text and tried, and figure to, tried to discern what we thought was correct. So um, in, in the, the, the point of, uh, to, to Alexa's uh, point, if, we, um, uh, if, if the RPC doesn't have a question, they don't have to come to us, they just do. If they want to go to the RSWG, the RSWG's output, as was discussed yesterday, uh, the, earlier in the week, is RFCs through through the RSAB, right? You, you do a draft and then it comes back to us. The RSAB uh, has two functions. It's to um, review those review those work uh, and, and, and approve or not the, R, the, the documents that drafts and to occasionally provide opinions uh, to the RPC. So uh, that's how I view the role, at least. And um, I, I guess I'll stop there. If there's any concerns, right, about the RPC going too far, then the RSWG can have that discussion too. They can bring it to the RSAB so that we know if, if we know people feel feel like we may have said the wrong thing if, if we did. Um, so those are those are some thoughts that I have. Again, it's just me. I don't see other people from the RSAB except for Jay. I don't know if Jay has a view on this. And and Jay shakes his head. Um, and I I will say that. Um, 9280 does have some lines which are the equivalent of Spencer Dawkins' "Do the right thing." That um, you know, uh, uh, you know, the RSAB should be talking to the RSWG. The RSWG should be talking to the RSAB, and and people should be noting what the other ones are doing and and getting things done. Uh, that these lines are not uh, walls. So, uh, Robert, I'm going to return to the getting things done yes. topic. Um, I think it would be useful since we are actually developing a bit of a tactical plan to keep a roadmap somewhere and actually, I hate these things, but set like deadlines, milestones. Yep. So, um, but have it out so that we can argue about whether or not our roadmap is putting the focus in the right place. Um, I, it, you didn't see my heart sink, but I think it's the right thing to do. Um, I, I hate those things, but yeah. Um, uh, appreciated. Um, I didn't expect to be ahead of schedule. Um, yeah, Jay, go, or Robert, did you want to be back in the queue? Yeah, yeah, um, okay. Sorry, I lost connectivity on all devices. No, no worries. So I'm, I'm the queue. Um, one of the things that was discussed very early on when the RSWG was set up was creating a repo for discussing specific language changes. Um, the chairs felt that that wasn't yet necessary, and I think we probably passed the threshold where it was necessarily like, you know, some time ago. So if the chairs would agree to do that, it would be fantastic because I think there are lots of different language changes that we need to start recording and discussing. Okay. No, I think that's okay. We can start. Yeah, I, I, uh, an, I, I was kind of hoping that the uh, repo would be a little more organic than it turns out to be. And again, this goes back to the sort of more active chairing of setting up some space to put in specific language changes as, you know, issues and things like that. Yeah, go ahead, Jake. I, I don't mean to be picky, but the chairs did actually stop the members of the working yes. group for creating yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah. doing all of that. So yeah, right. if the chairs could re-enable that. Yep. Not a problem. I, I agree. Robert? The existing working group repo is um, awkwardly named. I would suggest moving it to something that's just named RSWG and so it's oh. easier to find. Um, 
the links okay. from the data tracker help, but people just go type search and they uh, get that box, right? Fair um, enough. Can I throw in my... Absolutely. We, we are now in the um, moving things forward and any other business space. So. so at the very beginning of the meeting, there was a question about whether or not the tooling allowed Unicode anywhere. Ah, uh, yes. It does not yet. We have a PR that will let it. Every time I get to ready to merge that PR and release it, I run up against the slight net that the RSAB instructions included that, that focused on the use in a few elements like T, right? And it did not give us, you know, their, their interpretation wasn't about everywhere. It's pretty clear that this group has everywhere. Is there going to be any backlash against the tools team if I just go ahead and merge and release that now? And should this group push something forward and do we have a tool to do it through anything less weighty than an RFC? Because this is just a, you know, interpretation of, you know, the rec recognition of an, a misinterpretation of a, of a previous RFC to say that, yeah, it's just fine. Go on, do your thing. And Okay, so without my chair hat on, I have a follow-up question for you about this. Um, is there a belief that allowing something in the tool is an implementation of policy as against, for instance, if the RPC gets a document which has Unicodes in places where they don't think they belong, they push back, but the tool still allows it. You understand my me, question? Let me restate. Yeah. The policy, and, and you're correct, the policy is what actually gets out into the um, RFCs, and it's the RFC editor's choice to enforce the policy on, you know, while that piece of Unicode is just really not, a great thing to do it's not the tools job to be restrictive the right. tooling should help authors not have late surprises and we i think we've got general everything i've heard said that um the restriction that the tool currently has is actually hurting more than helping so um, I, I'd just like to free the tool, let the tool move forward. But I do think that there is still a, uh, uh, or I would ask if there is a artifact that needs to be laid down in some way to reinforce that this is a humans at the RPC's determination to make. Right. And I think the, this leads to a more general issue that I need to bring to the RSAB, which is, in general, if we hear, if I sense that consensus is going in a particular direction on a policy, um, it, it seems to me that if they haven't heard it yet, I should be talking to the RSAB about what direction that is, if it's going to have significant impact on tooling, on implementation, on the way editing is going, so that preparations can be appropriately made. Um, and I expect the RSAB to be sitting here and understanding that too. Um, in this particular case though, my gut would be the right thing is, the tool gets more permissive and any enforcement of the policy happens between the editors and, and the authors. That, that would be my gut. I'm certainly willing to hear people here in here say, whoa, 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 not, not so fast. Yeah. So, you know, my intent is then in within a few days, we'll ship a version of XML RFC that, will let Unicode happen pretty much anywhere. And and we have at least two RSAB people in the room having heard that. So, um, Karsten, you're up to bat. Yeah, first of all, thank you, Robert, for, for saying that. Um, I just want to remind people that there is currently no policy in place that even allows the tool to do that. Um, on the other hand, it, it certainly was uh, a useful thing to have 
during the first uh, almost five years of, of using RFC XMLv3, shielding the RPC from interpreting what exactly RFC 7987 says. And the reason is that, that we do use RFC XML and XML to RFC as an authoring tool as well. And if the, the authors cannot write things that, that are controversial, then they, they, we have no way to actually invoke these, these conflict resolution processes. <clears throat> so um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to, um, for the tool to no longer uh, summarily block this. Uh, but of course, uh, th there is an understanding here um, that people don't write RFCs to try the patience of, of the IPC here. And the, the, the one, one biggest yes, problem, yes. We, technical problem, excuse me, uh, we have right now is uh, that, that the mechanism that um, selects fonts for the PDF rendering of, of uh, weird characters uh, requires human intervention each time a new class of, of character is is uh, uh, being started to to use. So uh, then Gilmer had this uh, snowman with snow and snowman without snow, and for some and, reason, and Robert Robert is nodding his head at you understandingly. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Paul. Um, I want to say two things to what Robert said without disagreeing that the tool should be completely permissive. One is there is not agreement in this working group that Unicode can be anywhere. In the discussions on the mailing list of my draft, which still is not a working group draft, uh, there were people who said, oh, no, you don't want it there. So there still will be consensus, and therefore the tool might be too permissive at some point. That's just fine. The tool also allows British spelling, which might get <laughs> changed. And that's not, you know, like the right. style guide says you shall not use British spelling or whatever. And, and it gets through. Well, I'm sorry, <laughs> similar. I, I, I was just picking one off this. Okay, bad spelling, like actually incorrect spelling, whether it's British or English, you know, there is spell T H E I R or I, you know, whatever. The tool allows that. Right. And that's just fine. We know that the RPC will use its judgment on spelling and such like that. And that's really important because, quite frankly, I believe from having seen the previous discussion, we are not going to allow Unicode anywhere, even though I personally would like to, to see it everywhere. So I don't want anyone making that assumption. But the tool is not there to warn you about certain things. At worst, once you take it, if it's a working group document, once you take it to your AD, your AD should be looking at that and possibly the stream should be looking at that. And this has come up specifically with mathematical symbols. Yeah, and as Robert said, the tools are there to be helpful when they can be, and we like that. And as Karsten said, um, we don't want uh, authors to be um, willy-nilly about doing annoying things to the RPC, so. Uh, Jay. Yeah, um, I'm not sure how this got quite so complicated. Um, so the RSUB has decided that the interpretation of the policy that has been asked by um, the RPC is correct, right? Or the, the number of people asked, that's fine. Um, the, the, the tool will allow Unicode anywhere, that's fine, but it is that the style guide and RFC 7997 put limits on how it can be used in RFCs. And so, you know, as Paul said, yes, the, 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 the tool allows bad spelling, but, the, you know, thankfully the RPC don't. So th that, that there's, that, that's the policy. There is no, you know, that, um, that's why I wasn't sure where Carson was saying that there's no policy that allows this. There is a policy. The policy is our new RFC editor model that says that this is what the RSAB can do, and the RSAB has done it, and it's followed, and it's all, you know, Simple to right, but I, I think yeah. Robert's question it was more to: Does the tool have to invoke, have to enforce that policy? And I think the answer he's hearing is no. Yeah, yeah sorry, it was more Carsten's comment. Got it. it like, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Jay. Um, Phil. Yeah, I was just going to say that if people like the Form Methods Group do come up with uh, peculiar ideas, one of the things that 
could be an output from that working group would be, hey, this is what we need you to do, and this is how we can do it, and here's a formal specification for... Right. You know, and uh, I think Paul's point about this may also be stream by stream, you're going to have to ask the question, um, what do you need? What, what kinds of output is going to be reasonable? Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Karsten. Yeah, I would like to point out that uh, whoever wrote 7997 didn't think about other streams than the IETF stream. Mm. So um, everything in, in 7997 that restricts the, the uh, use of characters is based on an interoperability uh, concept. Now, in, in the IRTF, we don't care about interoperability. We care about getting people to publish things. And I have heard more than once in the IRTF that people cannot really publish in, in the, the RFC series because it's too much pain uh, to get the, the uh, documents done with the current situation. And the current situation not only includes Unicode, there's also an SVG problem, which we will address in time. Um, but I think we, we have to consider that, that different streams have different requirements here. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Elliot. Yeah, but just very briefly. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the R7. I'm here. Um, I, I agree with Jay's interpretation of what we said. I don't see any problem with uh, Robert removing uh, or the tooling team removing restrictions in terms of uh, what, what XML, R, XML to RFC generates. It does not remove the strictures uh, in the various RFCs that uh, require that that prohibit um, uh, Unicode in certain cases. So um, I'll just leave it at that. We don't have anything else before us, and I don't want to get ahead of you know anything else that was said in that regard. Thanks. All right, um, we still have fourteen minutes left, and I'm happy to give them to you for lunch if you want them. Going once, going twice. Hope to see you on an interim online meeting soon. I'll post things to the list. Oh, thank Karsten, you. did you want to jump in? No, I just wanted to say thank you for running this meeting. This was very oh, my pleasure. Cheers. Yeah, I was going to add the same thing, Pete. Uh, good job. Thank you so much. I do get a little bit confused when I'm talking about the RSAB and the RSAG. It should all be RSAB, I'm guessing. Um, thank you, sir. Yeah, that, that acronym and people mess up that one more than I thought. There was an RS, and, but I've heard, R, you know, RSB and RBAS, and, and people just don't, yeah. Who got that one?